Glad to have you with us for our first show of the year, and we start with a visit with Cowboy head basketball coach Mike Boynton. And just sort of to take things from the start, so to speak, just some observations on what's happened up to this point from a general standpoint. Well, you know, obviously a really strange start to the season. Um, date was pushed back. Season was sort of condensed. Uh, no fans in many places, very few fans at others. And uh, our team's trying to – was spending some time trying to figure out how to play in this new environment. And uh, your credit to the kids, we got off to a good start, played some uh, challenging road games early. And we always try to prepare ourselves for conference play as best we can. This year we had to prepare for it quicker because our first conference game was in mid-December as opposed to early January. Uh, but our team is developing an identity. Uh, we're a team that, that plays fast. We're at our best when we're getting out of transition. Uh, we're at our best when we've got three or four, sometimes five guards on the court at one time because we can take advantage of our playmaking ability. Um, and, and I'm glad to see in the last couple games, Isaac likely really start, step, start to step forward as the leader on the court. He's always been a leader in our locker room. He's always been a leader uh, in terms of practice. But his leadership on the court in games has really made a difference for us the last week or so. What's the biggest area of growth that you've had? Uh, I think our defensive connectivity. Um, we have guys who understand positioning better. They understand how we want to defend. Um, you know, we can rebound with pretty much anybody, you know, say West Virginia and the size that they have. But we went to Tech and did a pretty good job on the glass, which is something that they do well. And we've rebounded pretty well for not having a ton of size up front. And I think part of that is just um, that identity again of toughness and um, understanding that we just got to be a scrappy team. You have a unique roster in that you have, as you mentioned, the ability to play five guards and you have a lot of depth at guard, obviously not as depth, not as deep inside. So did it take, frankly, some time to kind of figure out, OK, this is the best starting lineup. These are the combinations that play well together, because given your roster, it, especially as young as you are, Probably not as obvious as it might be in some other seasons? Oh, no question. And then you don't have as much time to figure it out either, right? right. So instead of 12 non-conference games before conference play, we had six. And we didn't have everybody available for all six. You know, Avery missed three. Bryce missed one. You know, Chris has missed all except the first game. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times you get to December and you have Christmas break and then you come back and you've got a week of practices or so before conference play even starts. And you have that time to figure out that identity because you've got so much more data. But well, this year, you know, and everybody's dealing with this, so it's not an excuse, but the fact is the process was sped up. But you can't speed up that process because you just need time and reps and, and, and opportunities for guys to play together. Conference basketball, to me, is a lot like a chess match. It's you make a move, and then there's a counter move, and it, and it go on, goes on and goes on and goes on throughout the course of the year. And everybody recognizes that you like to get out and transition. You're by far, even with the analytics, the fastest-paced team in the Big 12, by far. It's not even close. So as you know that teams are going to try to do something to offset that, you know, what things are you thinking about, ways that you need to improve so that you have that counter opportunity that you can implement when teams attempt to try to, to limit your strength? Well, it almost always starts on the defensive end because it's pretty hard if we can either force turnovers or defensive rebound efficiently to stop us from getting our break started. So if we can be efficient on the defensive end, which we've been good. We haven't been elite on the defensive end, but we've been one of the top teams nationwide defensively. Um, we'll give ourselves a chance to continue to play with great pace. On the other hand, we got multiple guys who can initiate offense for us, which then makes it more difficult to key in on one guy. We played pretty fast when Jawan Evans was here, my year as an assistant coach. But pretty much everybody knew he was going to be the guy bringing the ball up the court. Yeah. We were able to still play fast, but now, whether it's Cade or Ice or Bryce or Avery or even Rondell, we got multiple guys who can either rebound and push it themselves or get an outlet pass and start the break. So it makes it a little bit more difficult. So we'll continue to look at ways to counter other coaches trying to slow us down and make us more of a half-court team, which we can play there, but we're much better when we're getting out in, in the open court. The West Virginia game for 30 minutes was spectacular. Up by 19 points, so many good things on both ends of the court. And then West Virginia staged it, an enormous comeback and won the game. So I think everyone wants to know, how are the guys doing after a loss like that that 
obviously was was hard to swallow. Well, there's two parts of it. One, <clears throat> the recognition of we took our foot off the gas. And in this league, it takes 40 minutes to put a team away. And you you got to play full throttle, especially the way we have success anyway, right? The other part is we got to recognize for 30 minutes, we were pretty darn good. We were a really, really good team and a team that I think if we can play with more consistency that way, can be one of the elite teams in all of America, which gives us a chance in this league to be in the top, you know, part of it and competing for a championship, which is what we want. Um, so we got to recognize that West Virginia, give them credit for coming back, but we had a pretty good team for three quarters of that game. We just got to understand as a young group, you got to put it together for 40 minutes. Your next game is at Kansas State, and fans that follow basketball will look at their roster and they won't recognize many names. Mike McGurl might be about it for most people. They have a lot of new players. There's a lot of talk about Kansas State's struggles in December. They lost by double digits at home to a Division II team. But how much better do you think they are now compared to some of those non-conference games that, that frankly, uh, were probably resulting in negative attention as far as Kansas State was concerned? Sure. I mean, they're dealing with the same thing a lot of people were dealing with, except they're doing it with a bunch of freshmen. And we got several as well, but we also have a couple experienced guys who've been through it. For them, it's pretty much learning college basketball altogether. And they're doing it, just like I said earlier, in a shortened amount of time. And maybe as a high school kid, they don't respect Washburn and, and, and whether they can beat them. And, and the fact is that there are Division II teams that have really good players, some of them who many played in the Division I level at some point in their careers. But they've gotten a lot better in the last two weeks, partly because they've had a lot of practice time. Um, Bruce Weber's a tremendous coach. He's coached in the national championship game. He's had success at many different places. And there's no doubt that that team will continue to get better as the season goes along. So we'll have our hands full. They're, they're one of the most physical defensive teams in all college basketball every year. And even though they don't have in, you know, the sync, this, this, um, they're not as in sync offensively as they would like to be, they have an identity on the defensive end already. Then early next week on Tuesday, Kansas comes to Gallagher Iba Arena. What might be a little different or special about this Kansas team compared to some of the others that Coach Self has, has brought to Stillwater in recent years? Well, they've evolved like, like many other teams or programs around the country, and they, they play small ball a lot. Um, you'll see them, you know, usually Kansas has been known to have two pretty stout big men in, at, at one time and play high-low, and, and now they most at the most they'll have one, and sometimes they won't have any true interior players. Uh, they'll play five guards. They'll shoot a lot of threes. Uh, they've kind of evolved in that way the last couple of years, and, and obviously Coach Self is one of the all-time great coaches in the history of the game, uh, obviously an alum, and I'm sure he'll be excited to come back to his alma mater. Uh, but we hopefully will have a great game plan to, to uh, make sure he goes back to Lawrence not so happy. Stay with us. Coach Jim Littell and Casey Kendrick talk cowgirl basketball. We continue after these messages. Mercy.net slash Cowboys Ortho. This is not good. I need you to pick me up at 530. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then everybody runs. What is he doing? He missed the spot. This college application, I gotta get all my references. It's just a lot. I can get used to have him on the chauffeur. Oh, yeah? No texting. All right. Watch out for dogs. I got it. I know. Don't let Trevor drive. Thanks, Dave. And let's talk some Oklahoma State women's basketball. Coach Jim Littell with us. And coach, uh, boy, here we are uh, a few games into the conference season, 4-0 and in the conference season, atop the Big 12 right now. And, man, things have really, considering everything that has had an opportunity to go wrong, for you guys to be where you are, it's been really good. Well, we feel very fortunate. Uh, there's been a lot of people involved in the success from uh, Kim Duskin, uh, our medical staff, Dr. Ivan, uh, our coaches and players being very resilient. 
having a really coachable and, and fun group to work with. Uh, it's been a good start for our season. And let's start there in kind of looking back and recapping the season. One thing you have said to me over and over is I like this group. And I don't know if that's disparaging towards any group in the past, but this group is really fun to coach for you. And you've said it to me so many times. I mean, I can tell that is truly heartfelt. It is. Uh, we've got really good leadership with Natasha Mack. Jamie Asbury is growing into uh, a better leader every day. Uh, we've had some new faces join the program that I think have rejuvenated our program. And uh, just feel really good about it. We've got a lot of players that are pleasers. They, they want to do what the coaches are asking of them. Uh, we've had no attitudes. Uh, Effort's been exceptional, and it's just fun to go to the gym every day. A couple of kids that are new to the process, that would be a couple of freshmen. We know about the upperclassmen, and we'll, we'll applaud them as we go throughout the season. But Taylor Collins out of Muldrow obviously has a strong connection to Oklahoma State. Lexi Keys out of Tahlequah, another young lady from Oklahoma. Those two have come in, Coach, and have made immediate impacts. And we didn't know for sure if Lexi Keys was going to be able to join us as she did. Um, those two have been really, really big in this early success. They have, and, and they both come from winning programs, uh, very supportive families, been well coached on their high school teams. Uh, they're both young ladies that work extremely hard at it and are respectful of knowing how the game should be played. And obviously, Tay, uh, uh, being the daughter of Terry and the success that Terry had here under Coach Sutton, you see that influence in the way she plays. And you look at, again, going now to the other side or the upperclassmen, and you talked about Natasha Mack. Natasha Mack, with the way the offseason unfolded and going into this year, went from being a really big part and leadership of this team to really kind of being the face of the program. But she's so selfless that it's really not about Natasha Mack. This program right now may be more about the entire roster than it's been since you've been here. I don't think there's any question. Uh, she's, uh, she's very humble. She defers all the attention away from herself. Uh, she's, a, she's a player that in the locker room will speak up and congratulate uh, Jamie Asbury on, on the way that she played against Texas Tech. So. Uh, she's just one that uh, her teammates love her. They love being around her on a daily basis. And sometimes, Casey, you have situations where stars are resented by other players. Not the case with Natasha Mack. Let's talk about defense. This program has really become known for the blocks. You guys are tops in the country in number of blocks. Natasha Mack is second or third, kind of fluctuates depending on the week in blocks per game, but number one in overall blocks. She just got the second ever triple-double in Cowgirl basketball history with 10 blocks, points, rebounds, and 10 blocks. Defensively, this is kind of more of what I think Jim Littell way back when has always thought his team would look like. It is, and it, when, you've got, uh, when you've got guards playing hard on the perimeter and pressuring the ball and, and people being where they should be and very assignment conscious, it works. But when you've got somebody at the uh, rim to be a rim protector, it helps a lot as well. And with Tosh, uh, it's not only the shots that she blocks, but the shots she alters as well. So she's definitely a force in there and uh, she can clean up a lot of mistakes. Non-conference schedule was good. You're 4-0 now in the Big 12. And before we get talk about and move on to what's next, let's also let people know, and I think they probably understand this or maybe heard the broadcast know this by now, but you had five kids unavailable due to COVID protocol. The game against TCU that you won on the road came with a very short-handed roster. And many of those kids, including Cassidy DeLapp and Micah Dennis and Brittany Reeves, those kids have been huge contributors to this team. That accomplishment to go down there and win by 25 without those kids available, you just can't overstate how big of a win that was. No, it was a big win, Casey. And uh, we basically had two starters out and the first two players off of our bench. So that makes it that much 
uh, more of a big win when uh, we had four kids step up and play that hadn't got many minutes. Abby Winchester hadn't got a lot of minutes, and uh, she started and, and had 11 uh, rebounds, was big for us. Tolly did fine off the bench. Uh, Ruthie did fine off the bench, and uh, you know all of our all of our kids stepped up and, and and played a part in it. Begay came in and and scored six points, so all of them contributed, and it was fun to see them be successful. Yeah, Abby had the big rebounding day. Mentioned uh, didn't mention Lauren Fields, obviously a huge loss and not having her available, and uh, Kennedy uh, Jackson as well. Okay, so coach, let's. Let's zoom fat pass to this weekend. We're supposed to be playing Kansas. Kansas has got some protocol issues as well with COVID. They're unavailable. So how, how do you handle this and now this extended time off going into Iowa State next week? Well, we're back in the weight room uh, today and a, a big stretch with Nick and then probably just shoot a lot of free throws. We got home late last night, uh, played uh, – Played some players a lot of minutes tonight, so I think it's time to, to give them a little rest. And, and But they will be back in the gym working on their shot today. Our protocols at Oklahoma State have been uh, followed by a lot of other people because it's been so good. How many times have you been tested? <laughs> I can't, I can't even keep track. One of your support staff told me they've been tested 28, so I bet you've been tested even more than that. But Oklahoma State's done a great job. You guys have done a great job with it as well, being very deliberate and trying not to allow this uh, any kid to get sick. Unfortunately, if you have, but uh, it's worked out well. Congratulations on the quick start and being at the top of the Big 12, and best of luck against Iowa State. Thanks, Casey. Appreciate it. With that, we need to take a break. When we come back, we're going to switch gears. We're going to talk about softball. A former softball player, Mariah Gearhart, not making her contribution in softball, but in another sport. It's kind of fun to story to talk about. We'll do that coming up next. This one is intercepted. Yeah. Decorative towel. There was a mess. I wiped up a mess. Yeah, you Game day is a go. There's a Bud Light there. ADM milling is really a part of the fabric of the Enid community. So if we were to have lost them, it would have been more than the 70 jobs that they employ. OGE, the city of Enid, and the Enid Regional Development Alliance were all great to work with. Not only does it allow for the growth of the new mill, but also the power is there to make that happen for the future. Welcome in. I'm Jessica Morey, joined by former Oklahoma State Cowgirl softball player Mariah Gearhart. Thank you so much for joining me, Mariah. Of course. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited. And we are super excited to have you because you were recently named to a U.S. national team for flag football. Now, you played softball at Oklahoma State. When did you get into flag football? Uh, very ironically, actually, right after I graduated, um, I was recruited to play on the slow pitch team for ESPN, obviously, immediately as I got there. And um, at one of the slow pitch games, then we had a couple subs who asked me if I wanted to play flag football. And I was like, there's flag football, like for adults. I was like, yeah, definitely sign me up. And it literally just took off from there. I got recruited by some of the more elite players. And I've been playing since 2011 ever since. And so now you're on the U.S. national team. Were you on the national team in 2018 as well? I was, yes. So uh, defending gold medalists. That's awesome. How did you get uh, all the way to the national level? Honestly, it was a kind of a route that we didn't know existed until uh, one of my, my quarterback actually for Team USA um, was my rival quarterback in our women's division. And she had sent me a link and was like, did you know that there was a USA team? And uh, when they had played back in 2016, is when we kind of figured out that uh, USA football even had a flag football team. So we are going to go and defend a gold medal from 2018. And you're getting to travel all over the world to get to play flag football. What is that like for you? Uh, for me, it's definitely 
it's like a dream come true because obviously being a softball player, I originally wanted to play for Team USA since I was little. And when I was in college is when softball was taken out of the Olympics. So my Olympic dreams were pretty much crushed and I knew that I wouldn't be going for softball because even by the time it got back into the Olympics potentially, I was going to be way too old by then. <laughs> and knowing the youth that was coming up, I was like, all right, so softball is out for Olympics. And so now that I'm being able to represent Team USA in a different sport that I've kind of just fallen in love with, it wasn't something that I grew up playing with softball, kind of is like a different level of a dream come true and a next level of an accomplishment too, because it was kind of unplanned. And so now it, I take a lot of pride in it because I've committed myself to it, um, kind of without an intention to do it. And how does playing college softball translate to being so successful at flag football? Um, I think what I figured out, especially like hand-eye coordination, obviously there's actually a lot of softball players that come out and most of them have a really, really good hand-eye coordination to translate, but also like, especially when you have outfielders, it being able to track the ball. It's not something it's, I feel like as a softball player, we take it for granted because we've been training and working on, you know, catching balls over our shoulder and being able to track a ball and working on our depth perception and um, being able to run and look at a ball at the same time. Not a lot of people do that in their sport. And so being a softball player, that was probably the easiest thing. And of course, for a, a female to be able to catch a deep ball and being able to use their hands the entire time is something you rarely see in our sport, especially for women. So. For me, that was number one. And then also uh, being a rusher is my position. So I rush the quarterback and uh, being able to have the speed and agility. Like I still use a lot of my training that I had at Oklahoma State to help prepare me to rush and play flag football. So you're representing Team USA, but you're also representing Oklahoma State. So what is it like getting to represent Cowgirl softball on such a big stage? Oh, it's what I definitely take pride in. I try to make sure everybody knows every single time, like I, I'm an Oklahoma State cowgirl and it's not to really brag on myself, but really to brag on the university because I wouldn't be the athlete that I am without Oklahoma State. The fact that I still use my training that I did at Oklahoma State to help prepare for this is where I give all my credit. And then just being able to, you know, deal with media still, being able to still do my profession, being able to still handle this kind of as a hobby it's not a profession but still be able to handle my professional job and then you know real life too being you know I'm not a student athlete anymore so there's a lot more adult responsibilities so all of that is because of how Oklahoma State helped me from my professors to you know all of our uh, tutors and everybody in the AC that helped me at Oklahoma State like I give all the props of me being able to be successful even now in adult life is because of how Oklahoma State prepared me on every single level as an athlete. That's awesome. So what is next for you? What are the next, you know, six months look like for you before you actually compete in the national tournament? Woo! It is so, so exciting. There is so much happening with USA football. We have USA tackle even trying to merge with flag football for like the first time ever. So being able to have them behind us is going to give us a lot more opportunities to also be more involved with the NFL. Um, so I can officially say a lot of the things that have been rumors as of right now, but we're definitely looking to go play overseas, be more involved with um, NFL flag as well, and uh, possibly be able to um, play more internationally, honestly, before we do go over to Spain, because that's actually never been done before. Most of the time we're having to get out there almost an entire week or more before the IFAF tournament to be able to practice because we don't really play together. And so now with um, this team being created and being more involved with the actual flag world that we play in, we're able to play together a little bit more, but USA football is going to really help us be able to go play overseas and play more international teams to prep us before uh, we go over to Spain in October. And so you go to Spain in October for the world championships. Just, I know it's a little bit away, I'm a little bit less than a year, but just how exciting uh, when you think about that, getting to go to Spain, uh, you know, and getting to represent Oklahoma State and, and Team USA. For me, it's super exciting because I've never technically been overseas. We went to Panama in 2018. So that was my first real like international because I'm from San Diego. So I don't count going to Mexico as really international. 
and I've been to Canada, so I've been like on each side of the border, but Panama was my first like real trip. But now that I live in Florida, it was kind of a really short flight. So uh, I don't know how excited I am about a 14 hour flight, but it will be my first like international flight. So I'm super excited to be able to go overseas. My sister was um, overseas for her master's in England. And she just told me so many great things about being able to travel internationally and be able to see just a completely different world and being able to be in Spain and at a really amazing location on Moresco Islands is something I'm so, so excited about. So I'm I'm excited obviously to play, but there's a lot of like sightseeing that I'm super excited to do too. <laughs> That's awesome. And we are super excited for you. We will definitely be cheering you on here in Stillwater. I can't wait. Thank you guys. Go Pokes. Go Pokes. Thank you.